friends and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking about this absolute beauty of a plant, the Raphidophora tetrasperma. It is such an easy care plant, probably one of the fastest growing plants in my collection, and just all around an absolute stunner. So the Raphidophora is commonly known as a Monstera minima because of its split leaves similar to that of a Monstera, but they're actually not related at all. <laughs> so it's kind of a misnomer, but it does give you the very similar split leaf vibes that Monsteras do. So if you want a Monstera but want something a little bit smaller, but like fast growing and super viney, Rafita for Tetrasperma is the plan for you. If you don't know me already, my name is Emma and I make houseplanty content all over the internet. So if you want to follow along with my houseplant journey and learn something along the way, subscribe to my channel and watch some more of my videos. Right, let's get into the care of this gorgeous thing. Bright indirect light is ideal for Raphidophora tetraspermas. They will absolutely thrive in that sort of light. A little bit of dappled sun throughout the day is fine, and maybe a tiny bit of early morning or late afternoon sun when it's not too hot or harsh. It'll it'll love you for it. Unfortunately, if they get too much bright, indirect, hot sun, they can burn. I have a couple of leaves on my plants that have gotten burned from direct sunlight for too many hours. This one is about a meter and a half away from a southwest facing window. And so in the spring, when the sun was a little bit lower in the sky than it is now that it's summer, it would get like quite a few hours of hot afternoon sun and I think that did a number on some of these leaves. So you do want to beware about keeping it in too, too bright a space. It isn't going to thrive in that situation. On the other hand, too low of light can negatively impact this plant as well. It can cause the growth to slow down and become really leggy. It can cause the leaves to decrease in size and even lose their split completely. So it's really not ideal to keep them in too low of light if you possibly can keep them in a bright and direct. This is actually one of the few plants in my collection that doesn't get any grow light at all. It just thrives being a little bit pulled back from my southwest facing window, except when the sun was too bright. <laughs> we can avoid that. It's fine, it just has a couple slight blemishes from that, which is my bad and I need to be more careful during those times of year to make sure that it's not getting like burny sun. I find these guys to be on the easier side when it comes to watering. They don't want to be too, too moist all the time, but a little bit of moisture is good for their soil and for their roots. They'll really like that. I probably water when the soil is about 50 to 75% of the way dry, sometimes even 100 if I'm feeling lazy. For me, in my home, that tends to be about once a week in the spring and summer and much less in the autumn and winter. Overwatering is probably one of the leading killers of these guys, so avoid watering it when the soil is still damp because that can cause things like root rot and cause the leaves to go yellow and mushy. Not ideal, we don't wanna kill our plants like that. When you do water though, you wanna make sure that you're watering super thoroughly. Overwatering isn't about the amount of water you're giving it at a time, but more about the frequency of watering. So when you water, you wanna make sure that the entirety of the soil gets nice and soaked and water is coming out of the drainage holes of the pot. Once you've watered it, you wanna make sure you empty out the cash pot that it's in to make sure that it's not sitting in a puddle of water at the bottom. That is another fast track to root rot, so that should be avoided if at all possible. I water this one a little bit differently than if you didn't have it on a pole. Because I have mine on a pole, I only water the pole in the showers usually, and through gravity, the water will go down into the soil and I'll let it drain out for a while. This works perfectly for the sort of moss pole that I have because I want that to stay moist because it is getting moisture through the pole as well. Normal household temperatures should be fine for these guys. If you're comfortable in your home, then they'll be comfortable. Their ideal is between 16 and 27 degrees Celsius or 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperatures below something like 10 Celsius or 50 Fahrenheit can actually harm your plant, so avoid putting them in temperatures that low. They also aren't big fans of fluctuating temperatures, so if you've got really drafty windows or like heating and air vents, try and avoid putting them near that because they're not going to enjoy it. They will however enjoy going outside in the summer if you live in a place that's within that temperature range. 
they will absolutely thrive outside as long as you're not putting them in direct sunlight and that you bring them in before the temperatures drop again in like the winter. They can tolerate normal household humidity like between 30 and 40 percent but they'll much prefer humidity over 50 or 60 percent that is like their ideal so if you can provide that they'll definitely thank you for it i personally don't give mine any extra humidity at all because my home tends to be in the 50 to 60 percent range but if you do need to boost the humidity you can try something like putting on a pebble tray grouping it with other plants as that naturally boosts the humidity or getting something like a humidifier I feed mine like once or twice a month in the spring and summer and less or not at all in the autumn and winter. Depends on my mood and how well it's growing. <laughs> if it's still growing, you can afford to give it some fertilizer, but if it's gone a bit dormant for the winter, probably stop because you definitely don't want to over fertilize it. I personally use liquid gold leaf for your... For your <sighs> I personally use liquid gold leaf fertilizer about every other week when I'm watering the poles. So the fertilizer is actually going into the moss pole, which is quite nice. And I do this at full strength because liquid gold leaf is a specific houseplant fertilizer. If you're using an all purpose fertilizer, you might want to reduce the strength to half strength, just to make sure that your plant isn't getting over fertilized with like really intense fertilizers. It's also good to flush your plant and the soil about every month or so to remove any mineral buildup from fertilizing. So give it a thorough rinse in the shower or something and let it drain. Ideally not when you just water it, use that as your watering for that month and just get as much of the salts and minerals out of the soil as you can. You won't be able to see them, but it'll definitely help and keep your plant happier and healthier. Well draining soil is a must for Rapida for Tetrasperma. Ideally something chunky is good to give them air around their roots. They like to have a fairly airy root ball. I personally use Monstera and Philodendron soil from Soil Ninja. That tends to be a really chunky mix with orchid bark and perlite and pumice and stuff. So I highly suggest that if you live in the UK get yourself some Soil Ninja. This isn't sponsored by them, but I just absolutely love their stuff. And so far, my Rafita 4 Tetrasperma has been loving their soil too, so I cannot complain. These are super fast growers if they're in the right conditions. And so you're probably gonna have to repot at least once a year, if not more often than that, because they just, they just grow. They run, basically. They're running while other plants walk. They're running. They're filling the soil, they're filling their moss pole, they're just running. <laughs> so repot when you start to see that the roots are coming out of the bottom of the drainage holes or if your plant starts to slow its growth in growing season. When you repot, you wanna make sure you're giving them just one pot size up. You don't wanna give them too, too much space. So like two to four centimeters bigger or one to two inches that's gonna give them the right step up and you wanna make 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 sure that you're giving them a pot with drainage holes because you don't want the water sitting in the roots. Something special about the Rafita 4 Tetrasperma is they freaking love to climb. They love it. And so if you can possibly give them a support, they will just thank you so, so much by producing amazing, bigger, beautiful growth. You can let them trail, but they tend to become leggy and their leaf growth isn't as intense. So it's best to give them something to climb up if you can. You can give them something like garden stakes, either bamboo or plastic, quar poles, planks. I personally have mine on a moss pole, but if you don't want to give them anything, you can just give them your wall and they will climb it. That's how much they love to climb. They'll just climb your wall. It might damage your paint job a little bit, but they'll climb it anyway. <laughs> I personally love having mine on a moss pole. It has grown so, so well into it. You can like really see the roots at the back of it. I will show you, but it's like very precariously balancing on my IKEA cabinet right now and I don't wanna shift it. Otherwise, it might not get back into a nice place, but you can definitely see the roots coming through the back of this pole, which is amazing. Why I love the clear back poles. And it just loves that extra moisture that comes with this sort of moss pole. I'm watering it about every week at the moment in the spring and summer, probably a little bit less in the autumn and winter. I only recently just put it on this pole like this spring. So I'm not quite sure what the balance is in winter yet, but 
I'm sure I'll have to lower it a bit. Rafita Forehead Touches Roma are super easy to propagate through stem cuttings. As long as the cutting has a node, it will probably root and grow quite quickly. When taking a cutting, you want to make sure you're using clean knife or scissors just to prevent any sort of bacteria or grossness like entering into your plant. So I like to spray my scissors with isopropyl alcohol solution before I make any sort of cuts on plants like this because it's better for them and better for the cuttings. Once you've got your cutting, you probably want to let it callus over for a couple of hours. Just let the cutting seal itself a little bit. You can put it straight into water, but I found that they are a little bit more prone to rot if you do that. So letting it dry out for a couple of hours is going to help it in the long run. Once your cutting has calloused over, you want to put it in the medium of your choice, whether that be straight back into the soil, water, perlite, moss, whatever you fancy. I've previously done it in water and that worked really well. I think if I were to do it again now, I'd probably put it in moss, but that's because I've been propagating most things in moss. So it's really whatever you like. They're fairly easy going when it comes to propagation. Once it's grown a decent root system, like I like to say when it's proportional to the plant, like if you look at the plant and the roots, it's like one third roots and two thirds plant. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that's how I kind of go about it in my planting. Once it's proportional and got a decent sized root system, pot it up into some nice chunky soil and wait for it to grow more. I found that my propagations do take a little bit to get going once they've been potted up. They are a little bit slower than the like insane rapid growth of like an established plant. So it might take a little bit to get it going, but once it goes, it's gonna go. Unfortunately, Rafita Fora Tetrasformis are toxic to cats, dogs, other household pets. Not to humans, but I probably still wouldn't eat the plant. Ingestion in pets can cause like drooling, mouth, and throat and digestive system irritation and even vomiting and that kind of thing. So avoid letting your pets eat this beautiful plant. Also because then it wouldn't look as pretty. So keep them out of reach of pets if you possibly can. So that is it. Those are my care tri trips and kicks, tips and tricks to take care of your Rafita for Tetrasperma. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up down below and leave a comment on other houseplants you'd like me to talk about in the future and subscribe for more. Thank you so, so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye!